What does Beowulf have to do with West African languages? They're linked by the groundbreaking work of Lorenzo Dow Turner. Hello, and welcome to Footnoting History. I'm Lucy, and on this episode of Footnoting History, I'll be talking about the career of Lorenzo Dow Turner, a Black American linguist and literary scholar. Pursuing an active scholarly career in the era of Jim Crow, he virtually founded an entire field of study. And that field, Gullah Studies, has been flourishing since the publication of his magnum opus. Both as a professor of English literature and as a scholar of linguistics, Turner worked to rewrite the narrative of Black people's place in American history. To quote Matthew Vernon, he employed the tools and structure of a traditional field to construct a revolutionary idea. Let's start with a brief biographical sketch of our subject. Born in North Carolina in 1890, he attended Howard University in Washington, D.C. from 1910 to 1914. One of the oldest HBCUs, Howard had been chartered as a university in 1867. By the time Turner attended, it was an acknowledged intellectual powerhouse. There he studied English, played baseball, and was voted most handsome senior. At Howard, he received a classical education designed to give its black students recognized cultural capital. Turner was still working, as a waiter for a time and later as a train porter, in the intervals of his education, but was accepted into a master's degree at Harvard in 1915. This time, by his own account, taught him how to concentrate and prepared him to teach English at his alma mater, Howard. Here, he impressed his students, not only intellectually. Zora Neale Hurston later wrote that she had such a crush on him that she briefly considered becoming an English teacher. The photo accompanying this podcast will show you why. After two years as an instructor, he started his PhD at Chicago, still in an experience relatable for all graduate students, doing odd jobs to help pay for his degree, which he finished in 1926. His coursework concentrated on English language literature, both modern and medieval. Turner considered trying to study the languages of Black Americans for his dissertation. What prevented him was the lack of adequate technology for making oral history interviews in remote locations. His most iconic work would come later. So how did he get from PhD work and, eventually, chairing Howard's English department to almost single-handedly creating a field of study? Teaching summer classes in South Carolina, Turner noticed that the students he was teaching sounded remarkably different from other Black Americans. And Turner, remember, had traveled throughout the Northeast as well as the South and Midwest. It was this experience that motivated him to enroll in further coursework in linguistics at NYU and at the University of London, and do research in Paris. Equipped with this additional training, he undertook a project of analyzing the speech that had so intrigued him. Over a period of 15 years, he did just that. And he found, in the language of people living in the lowlands of South Carolina and Georgia, words for chickens and turtles, house and tribe, for crops and actions and joy, linked to the languages of Nigeria, Angola, and Senegal, as well as Sierra Leone. He even found specialized vocabulary for West African customs and people groups. Now, the historical context that helps to explain this is that the low and sometimes marshy soil of South Carolina made it ideally suited for rice growing. And the British who colonized it brought over enslaved West Africans, knowledgeable in such work, to undertake this cultivation. I'd like to emphasize this. These people were selected precisely because they came from Africa's historic rice-growing region. They were experts in precisely the skills that their enslavers needed. And they and their descendants retained, in their speech and song, many of the characteristics of West African languages, gradually and partially incorporating French and English. To white observers, this was merely a simplified dialect. Some scholars went so far as to dismissively call it bad English, or even, and no, I'm not kidding, baby talk. Turner's enterprise of analyzing Gullah as a language of its own pushed back directly against this. His major work, Africanisms in the Gullah Dialect, was finally published in 1949. 
In the introduction to this book, Turner points out, with remarkable scholarly restraint, that much previous scholarship on Gullah language and customs was limited or even just plain wrong because of white scholars' ignorance of West African languages, of linguistics, of regional culture, or some combination of the above. As a black intellectual in the early 20th century, Turner was following in the steps of such luminaries as W.E.B. Du Bois and the historian Carter G. Woodson, who launched the field of black studies. Longtime listeners may recall that I've done another episode on the diversity of approaches to studying and producing literature among black intellectuals during this period, focusing on James Weldon Johnson. Turner, a scholar both gifted and extremely dedicated to hard work, would apply his skills to interdisciplinary work over a period of decades. It's really hard to overemphasize both his diligence and his impact. He lived and worked on four continents, North America, Europe, South America, and finally, Africa, in order to uncover and analyze evidence. In doing so, he demonstrated not only enduring connections among the intercontinental African diaspora, but also the robust and sophisticated cultures of the people who carried stories and songs and a way of understanding the world across oceans. During the 1920s and 1930s, when Turner was first working, anthropologists and folklorists, both black and white, sought to uncover connections between African Americans and their African roots. At the same time, popular print media and artistic productions tapped the new appeal of black folk life, real or imagined. Think of Porgy and Bess, for instance. So in studying Gullah culture, Turner was not only doing scholarly work that was significant in its own right, but he was also writing against the work of white scholars inflected by popular stereotypes and fantasies who looked to find evidence of quote unquote real primitives rather than a unique, vibrant, and flourishing subculture of its own. Work on Turner tends to emphasize the retraining he did in order to study Gullah culture and how this was different from his more orthodox, if still exceptional, past as a professor of literature. But Matthew X. Vernon has showed how Turner approached language in similar ways over the course of his life, whether teaching Chaucer or researching African song. Language is used, of course, not only to tell stories, but to carry histories. It can be studied by linguists, anthropologists, literary scholars, and even, sometimes, historians. In doing the work that would become Africanisms in the Gullah dialect, Turner was demonstrating how African survivals were evidence of sophistication rather than, quote, backwardness or superstition, as they were often interpreted. He was also working to uncover, understand, and write the histories of Black communities in what could be viewed as the most traditional of ways. The same white establishment that read Beowulf and Chaucer and claimed a noble English heritage rhetorically excluded Black people from that heritage, even as Black Americans were systematically denied both legal rights and social privileges. Then as now, there were a variety of methods of fighting back against that problem. Frederick Douglass, for instance, rhetorically identified himself as a medieval warrior with all the qualities of courage and resolve possessed by the Scots lord whose name he took. Lorenzo Dow Turner took a different approach. Now stick with me for a minute here because I want to talk about Beowulf. Beowulf is, among other things, a poem about lineage and identity. In the opening lines, we cover four generations quite concisely, leading up to Hrothgar, the king who sends for Beowulf. He's clearly going to be an important figure in the narrative. Just as important, clearly, is that we understand where he comes from, both genealogically and geographically. Beowulf is also a poem about choices, about choosing loyalty, about choosing whom to believe, whom to help, and whom to honor. Perhaps obviously, it is an intensely political poem. And as I mentioned earlier, when Turner taught at Howard, he taught, among other things, medieval English literature. This included both Old English, like Beowulf, and Chaucer. Indeed, during the years of Turner's professorship, in part because of his professorship, Howard was expanding its medieval literature curriculum. And this was a political move. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, 
there was a lot of talk about how language was connected to culture. There was, particularly, a lot of talk about how national language was, allegedly, connected to national culture. National culture, very much in air quotes, is obviously a problematic concept in itself. And in the United States during this period, the version of national culture under discussion was almost always one that excluded black people. Remember how white scholars denigrated Gullah language as defective English or baby talk? Those things are very much connected. So Howard University's and Lorenzo Dow Turner's teaching of English and American literature was a way of asserting both the right and the ability of Black Americans to study, understand, and participate in the sweeping history of the English language. It was thus also an assertion of the right and the ability of Black Americans to fully engage in the discussions about what American culture was and should be, and who should stand on its foundations. As a medievalist, I would also like to mention that the questions Turner asked his students about literary texts were both fascinating and challenging. I am convinced that it would have been a mesmerizing experience to have him as a professor. I am not at all sure that I would have done well on his exams. One, for instance, asked his students to write on principal verse forms used by Chaucer in the Canterbury Tales, preterite present verbs and the weak declension of adjectives in Chaucer, and at least two of the following, Chaucer's handling of his sources in The Knight's Tale, evidence for placing Chaucer's birth between 1340 and 1345, some literary parallels to the Canterbury Tales that Chaucer may have been familiar with, the marriage group of the Canterbury Tales, and the clerk's tale as satire. Turner and his colleagues who taught language and literature read both language itself and the stories it told as preserving culture and teaching social values. All too often, these ideas were used to reinforce racist theories about how the alleged absence of robust African literatures, when contrasted with, say, English and the Canterbury Tales, demonstrated a lack of cultural survival. So, in recording proverbs and idioms, language, and texts of the Gullah communities, Turner was doing much more than only linguistic work. He was demonstrating to a skeptical establishment that Black Americans, despite the violence of enslavement and forced diaspora, had cultivated and retained a literary and cultural past as vibrant, as communicative about the full richness of human experience as any of the canonical texts by white authors that he taught. Chaucer's Canterbury Tales was famously described as containing all of God's plenty. No less, according to Turner, could this full variety of human experience be found in the proverbs and idioms and songs he recorded in South Carolina and Georgia, in Brazil and Africa. For much of his career, Turner struggled to obtain funding and support, and even, from some white scholars, recognition for his groundbreaking scholarship. But he kept working, receiving grants from prestigious international foundations, and expanding his teaching in the 40s and 50s to include the literatures of West Africa. Turner loved to lecture on how African drums spoke, and on the melodies of hymns and folk tunes that had come from Africa to America with the enslaved experts in rice planting. And facilitated by his tireless scholarship, the Gullah language and culture have been celebrated and spread through research centers, through heritage trips, and through public television programs in the U.S. A generation of scholars, almost two at this point, have built on Turner's work. Anne Bailey, for instance, has recently written about how songs helped to record and preserve Black history and communal knowledge, even amidst the violence of slavery including the violence of sale and relocation. Toni Morrison's novel, Song of Solomon, also explores the power of naming and language and song to carry neglected histories. Arguably, one of the most recent works of historical study and imagination that draws on the work of Lorenzo Dow Turner is Ring Shout, a novel by P. Jelly Clark, who is also a historian. And personally, I love that the passionate, erudite work of Lorenzo Dow Turner as literary scholar has inspired, and continues to inspire, storytelling as well as scholarship. Interested in owning some footnoting history merch? 
You can find out more through our shop link at www.footnotinghistory.com. Want to support the show and keep it open access? Our Patreon is at patreon.com forward slash footnoting underscore history. You can also follow us on Twitter at History Footnote or on Facebook and Instagram as Footnoting History. And of course, the best stories are always in the footnotes. <laughs>